Okay, uh, thank you, Claire, for joining us today for um, our special with um, Awareness Week. Um, so today um, we've got Claire, who's an OT in London, and she'll be talking to us about FND and OT. Um, I'm the president of FND Australia Support Services, and Julie is our online support director. Share my screen. Thanks, Kate. Thanks, Thanks Julie. Having a problem sharing my screen. Oh. Sorry. Okay, cool. I've got my slides here. Okay. So, um, Claire, would you like to tell us a little bit about your role um, at the National Hospital for Neurology and Neurosurgery in London um, and what you do with clients with FND? Sure. So um, I'm an occupational therapist and I uh, specialise in neurosciences, um, but I'm also a specialist in functional neurological disorder. Um, I'm the physical therapy, so occupational therapy and physiotherapy lead for um, an inpatient and an outpatient uh, rehab program specifically for F&D at the National Hospital for Neurology and Neurosurgery in London. Okay. Um, yeah. Excellent. Okay. Um, well, as you mentioned, you work with a multidisciplinary team for functional neurological disorder. So there is evidence emerging around the role mm. of, you know, MDT, multidisciplinary team for functional neurological disorders. Mm. Um, what's the role of an occupational therapist within this team in terms of treating people with FND? So I guess if we're thinking about the role of OT in general, um, it, the role of OT in treating F&D in general would be, might be quite different depending on uh, the setting that the OT works in. Um, if we're talking in the context of um, inpatient or outpatient rehab, um, basically the occupational therapy role will be very much based on what the patient outlines as their problem area or yeah. the goals that they set for rehab yeah. um, because as we know occupational therapy is a goal-directed therapy um, so what we would um, initially do is sit down with a person and work out how their functional symptoms may be impacting upon their ability to engage in day-to-day -day activities yeah. uh, and and then we set goals from there so it could be <clears throat> anything as broad from um, intervening and having problems with um, doing their own personal care or it could be things in the home such as domestic tasks or parenting um, having problems uh, with parenting it could be as looking at community ac access or <clears throat> going um, to university or going to work so the occupation and occupational therapy doesn't just um, refer to paid occupations yeah it also refers to any other daily activity that someone might need to or want to be engaged in yeah yeah and in terms of people with fnd um you're looking at they've got symptoms which impact on their daily life so you're looking at sort of the impact of the symptoms and doing any interventions around them as well that's right yeah so the interventions would depend on what the symptom type is um, so, for example, and I think we'll talk about this a little bit later, but if it's specifically functional movement disorder, um, so functional movement disorder obviously will impact upon a, a patient's ability to engage with their environment and engage with their day-to-day -day activities. Yeah. But along with functional movement disorder also comes other symptoms such as chronic pain and chronic pain and fatigue. Yeah. Um, that's very, that very commonly goes hand in hand. So yeah. it, it could be an occupation based intervention, but it can also be education around the symptoms and around symptom management strategies. Yeah. So maybe things like pacing. Yeah. A lot of um, fatigue and, and, and pain management education. So talking um, up to the person about what the mechanisms behind, behind chronic fatigue and chronic pain might be, um, how that can inter interact with their ability to do their day-to-day -day things, such as kind of like a boom-bust pattern of yeah. behaviour. Yeah. And, yeah, pacing within normal day-to-day -day activities. 
Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, and what we're seeing a lot now, we've got NDIS and we're often having um, people saying, I need a functional assessment. Um, mm -hmm. So for someone with FND, what does a functional assessment look like? Yeah, so uh, we do our occupational therapy assessments uh, um, in two stages. One would uh, be an occupational analysis. So what that means is that we would sit down with the person with FND um, in a talking capacity and we would uh, work out how their functional symptoms are impacting upon every single thing that they do day to day. Yeah. Um, everywhere from, uh, you know, from personal care, to accessing the community and we would break down the task components of that personal care um, or that kitchen task or that community access and work out how that person is on a good day and on a bad day so when their symptoms are a little bit better when their symptoms might be particularly bad um, and see whether there's any discrepancies between those two in terms of um, are they functioning at kind of a this kind of level all the time or do the symptoms wax and wane and yeah. if they wax and wane what's the occupational engagement like yeah um, and part of that is looking at what a person's 24-hour routine looks like so we would look at um, you know what what they're like from the time they get out of bed to when they go to bed at night um, <clears throat> Are there symptoms meaning that they they have lots of care needs during the day? Um, is the sleep wake cycle out of whack? Um, are they sleeping a lot during the day and have poor sleep at night? Uh, what's the occupational balance like? So what I mean by that is, um, do they have very little activity to engage in during the day, or are they trying to take on too much and they're yeah. kind of getting a burnout? Yeah, yeah, um, the, yeah. The twenty-four hour routine can really help to outline the impact that the symptoms are having on their day-to-day -day routines. Yeah, yeah. Oh. And, and, and then the second component, of course, is, um, a, is an activity analysis. So what that means is that the occupational therapy would ask the person with functional symptoms to undertake a daily activity while the OT is having a look at how their symptoms are uh, impacting upon their ability to do that activity. Yeah. So that could be <clears throat> that could be having a look at the person doing a fun, uh, transferring from bed to chair or chair to bed. Um, it could be having a look at them in the kitchen, doing a kitchen task, or um, getting out in the community. Anything that the patient identifies as being quite challenging. And then what the, what the OT would do is then sit down with the patient afterwards and, and speak to them about what they're noticing and what they're noticing about how the functional symptoms are impacting upon their movement or their ability to engage in that task. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and we actually, <clears throat> we actually find it quite helpful, um, Kate, to sometimes, with of course, with the person's consent, we, we video that assessment. Okay. And then we sit down with the patient afterwards and we show them the video and we, we first of all ask the patient what they're noticing about what's happening with the way that they're moving or the way that they're doing that task. Yeah. And then uh, because that helps to increase insight and we know that increased insight in, um, in symptoms is linked with um, better self-management. Okay. Um, and then from looking at that and speaking about the results of that assessment, then we work out a plan um, jointly with the patient about which areas we might be able to intervene at and, and what goal areas we might be able to tackle within the confines of our intervention period yeah. because the intervention period will be different depending on what setting you work in. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, does that make sense? Yeah, no, that's good, yeah. Okay, and then you know this will sort of head into interventions that 
might be made. Um, you know, the things that are quite common with FND are people who have the seizure type disorders, and I think you call them non-epileptic attack disorders in the UK, um, and also the mm -hmm. functional movement. So a lot of people have difficulty walking. That's a very common symptom. They're the two sort of main symptoms that people are dealing with, along with, of course, chronic pain and chronic fatigue. Um, so for mm -hmm. each of these, what type of you know, recommendations might you make to help people you know, manage the seizures, self-manage the seizures, or, you know, what type of things might you do if people are having, you know, struggles with walking, um, which then, of course, impacts yeah. all their occupational things that they might want to do in the community, at work, with study, etc. Sure, sure. Well, in terms of um, functional seizures, so we know that the evidence base behind treatment for functional seizures um, kind of lies with psychological therapies at present and in particular with CBT and psychotherapy. So yeah. if, if that is available uh, for patients with functional seizures, then OTs um, can work alongside psychological therapies with the patient with functional seizures. But yeah. in the absence of, uh, of psychological therapies, because they can be difficult to access yeah. depending on where you live, yeah. um, OTs can still, uh, occupational therapy can still be really helpful. So. Uh, where we probably start is uh, working out um, what the patient knows about their seizures. So um, have, they, have they identified any patterns or any triggers? Yep. So what I mean by that is that do they notice that their functional seizures might come on when they're, when they're in a lot of pain or when they're fatigued? Um, might they come on when they're um, in quite busy areas or um, after they've had an argument with someone or when they're particularly yeah. stressed by work, for example. Um, so again, we're just trying to increase self-awareness about what the triggers might be. Yeah. And then depending on what the triggers that identified are, um, the OT can then intervene at that level. Yeah. So it might be about doing some uh, pacing education around fatigue and pain management. Yeah. It might be looking at uh, things like anxiety management or stress, uh, things that might make the person more resilient to stress. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so depending on what those triggers are that the patient has identified. Yeah. Um, if, if work is a maintaining factor, the OT might get involved with helping sustain someone in, in work, for example. Yeah, and that's what we've had is work and school. Um, and they've been requesting seizure management plans as well. Yeah, yeah. Been, so that's, yeah. yeah, exactly. So um, occupational therapists combined with the patient, the rest of the patient's treating team um, can develop seizure management plans. Yeah. Um, so that could be twofold, reasons for twofold. So... Um, if uh, for significant others, um, the seizure management plan might outline a plan as to how that person with functional seizures might like their seizures to be managed within the home and within the community. Yeah. Um, so as to prevent having to go to A&E all the time, yeah. um, because we know A&E can be quite a distressing environment when people have functional seizures. Yeah. Um, and But also, if someone does end up in A&E, a seizure management plan can be really helpful um, because it can outline, um, first of all, that the patient has functional seizures um, and what that means for the person. So how they present, whether they can hear, whether they can see, um, how they like their seizures to be managed, um, for example, Many patients don't like to be given um, sedating medications, um, but when they end up in A&E, they quite often get given a lot of sedating yeah. medications, which can then make the recovery process much more difficult. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, yeah, a seizure management plan um, can be really, really helpful. Um, and then also the other thing that occupational therapists can do is, again, around increasing the self-awareness, um, Many patients uh, have a lot of anxiety, but they might not necessarily recognise the signs of anxiety in their, in their body um, and helping to increase that self-awareness of what that anxiety might look like. Yeah. Um, yeah. Because if someone's had a high level of stress for many, many years, the body kind of accommodates to it. Yeah. 
Um, and so, you know, um, I mean, my, my boss often says, I ring my, ring my hands and ring my elbows. I don't even know that I'm doing it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, um, so as OTs, we can help people recognize what the signs and symptoms of stress and anxiety might be so that then they can start to look at some management strategies to help um, intervene before their anxiety gets to a point that might lead to an, a functional seizure. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, there's grounding strategies, which, um, uh, you know, was de developed by psychological therapies, yeah. um, strategies that try and keep people in the moment. Um, so noticing detail in the environment around them, um, distraction techniques, um, conversation, um, touching different textures. Um, trying to ground them in the moment so that their their body is focused, their brain is focusing on something else rather yeah. than the trigger to the yeah. functional seizure. Yeah, and getting yeah. You know, panic and escalation because often you know, a seizure can just increase anxiety and people are anxious that they're going to have a seizure when they go out so then they don't go out. And, you, know, you can get that cycle, you know, with that you're anxious exactly. and then you have a seizure and then you're more anxious and just escalate. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, so that I guess that's that you know, there's lots to there's lots that OTs can do, but a graded task practice is another yeah. really important intervention yeah. strategy for functional seizures because yeah. many people with functional seizures understandably might disengage from activities that might be difficult or um, they might be fearful of doing, for example, as you mentioned, going out. Yeah. Um, so we would approach that activity in a very graded way, yeah. um, combine the use of intervention strategies to or management strategies for their functional seizures yeah. whilst undertaking a, a, a task that the pe person's identified as being difficult or stressful. Yeah, yeah. And building people's yeah. confidence back up as well. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Because that's certainly something that functional seizures does. Uh, you know, it really knocks people's confidence, which is yeah. completely understandable. Yeah. Yeah. And mm. people here have had bad experiences when they've had um, seizures in public and they've been treated appallingly. Um, so that increases people's anxiety about going out and being around mm. people in case they have a seizure in public. Yeah. Yeah. Of course. Of course. Yeah. And that's where, you know, maybe carrying a seizure management plan can be really helpful as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, in case they get, you know, get taken to hospital or paramedics are, are called. Yeah, and um, bystanders can get quite overwhelmed if they don't know what to do, if they don't know the history of the person. Um, it can be quite scary and overwhelming for bystanders too. Of course, yeah. of course, definitely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and so the other major issue, of course, is functional motor disorders. Um, mm. And a lot of people have problems walking. Some people are paralysed. Um, some people have left-sided weakness, right-sided weakness, both-sided weakness. Um, and that can, you know, if you can't get around, it changes your whole daily activities. You're not able to do what you want to do. Um, so... What do we do with someone that's having difficulty walking that's impacting their ability to do what they want to do to engage in what the activities that they want to engage in? Yeah, so occupational therapists alongside um, physiotherapists would tend to kind of start at the basics, really. Uh, where we would have a look at how the patient is moving uh, or the person is moving within their transfers mm -hmm. and having a look at what then what we're noticing. So are we noticing that um, the transfer is coming completely from the upper limbs or the arms and hands and yep. there's very little weight going down through the feet? Are we noticing that someone is transferring, like pushing up with their elbow crutches, um, which in, in itself can cause um, problems with arms and shoulders? Um, and you're looking at how they're weight bearing. Uh, are they weight bearing on one side versus another? Is it quite uneven? And you intervene at that level as to what you're seeing within those functional transfers. Mm -hmm. um, we would look at uh, implementing normal movement strategies. So getting uh, forward momentum and even weight bearing within the transfers within standing. Um, and then you're integrating those normal movement strategies and even weight bearing strategies within function. Um, so 
over short distances, but they're walking to improve quality before you add endurance, yeah. um, standing to brush their teeth, um, standing to have a shower, standing in the kitchen, uh, looking at strategies to improve efficiency um, of, of the body's movement. So because we, as we mentioned before, functional movement disorders can be really exhausting and they can cause secondary pain issues as well yeah. because of yeah. the, the bad habits that the body picks up. Mm. Yeah. Um, if, uh, and of course, and then you'd integrate that into longer distances outdoors. Um, if a person is unable to stand weight bear, um, then we would take it back a notch, obviously, and we would look at graded weight bearing within functions. So you might do that uh, in terms of uh, looking at perch sitting. So what I mean by that is having a slightly raised um, uh, seat, either from the side of a bed or from a therapy plinth or from a perching stool. And what you're doing is trying to engage the person in a functional task using their hands and their arms whilst they're getting a little bit more weight down through their feet. Yep. And the reason why we're doing that is to try and improve um, the sensory feedback that it, that's coming up through the patient's uh, or the person's feet and legs, yeah. trying to give them a, a, a normal sense of sensory feedback through their lower limbs. And then as um, then we would just gradually increase um, the, the height that they're standing or, or they're sitting at to try and increase that sensory feedback as well. And you might do that, we spoke about the fact that confidence is really important um, and, you know, coming up on your feet when they feel really weak is really quite scary. So you might actually do that with a raised plinth that they're sitting on, but also a raised plinth in front so that mm. they don't feel like they're going to fall or go anywhere. Um, if someone doesn't have any sensation in their legs, um, that that is an added level of complexity. So what we would often do is do joint therapy sessions with physiotherapy or with a rehab um, assistant or technician. And we might actually get the patient, the person with who has the movement disorder and sensory problems up into a standing frame okay. where again, we're promoting um, sensory feedback through the legs, but also the person is kept safe and they're, um, they're made to feel uh, more supported in, a, in a, a standing frame whilst we're doing an activity using their hands and their arms. Yep. Um, because using the activity, uh, doing an activity with their hands and their arms is a form of distraction as well. Um, so the person is not um, inadvertently focused on what's happening in their legs. Yeah. Um, so, and of course, uh, OTs can also, um, for, with functional uh, can also intervene if someone's having um, functional movement disorder that affects their upper limbs as well. Um, so that could be trauma, that could be weakness, uh, that could be um, dystonia in the upper limbs as well. Yeah. Um, so what we would do is again look at the actual problem that the person is experiencing and look at intervention strategies to either in the case of tremor, we might look at tremor entrainment or helping to switch off accessory muscle use and trying to reduce co-contraction in the upper limbs. Um, in the case of um, someone that might have functional weakness, we're trying to integrate that upper limb as much as possible and as normally as possible into functional tasks yeah. so that people don't kind of develop a learnt non-use of the upper limb. Yeah. You mentioned functional yeah. entrainment, um, perhaps you could, or tremor entrainment, I think. Can you um, explain to people what that is? Tremor entrainment. Yeah, so, <clears throat> yeah, so, uh, I mean, there's lots of, uh, you could probably, for people that are not familiar with tremor entrainment, you can have a look on YouTube yeah. um, and see quite a few examples. But um, it's, it's basically what we know um, with functional tremor, particularly upper limb tremor, um, it can be driven by an inadvertent uh, focus on on the symptoms. So, without so with tremor, inadvertent um, focus and without conscious control, tremor can um, be elicited. And so, what can happen is that if 
focus is redirected to, say, for example, the opposite upper limb, you can teach um, the person strategies to try and divert attention to the other upper limb. And what can then happen is that because the, the focus is off the tremoring upper yeah. limb, the tremor can start to settle. Yeah. And that, that can be used twofold. One, it shows um, people that the tremor can be, is changeable yeah. and therefore, um, you know, it, it, can, it can show them that the tremor is not there all the time and therefore we can actually intervene yeah. and um, can change that. Um, but also the beauty of occupational therapy is that we, you know, we use activity and function as a form of distraction. Yeah. Um, so you will often see that we, particularly with functional upper limb tremor, if you get someone engaged in an activity where they're really focusing on something else, such as in the kitchen, um, that actually their tremor might start um, to reduce or it might, the frequency uh, might not be as much or it might not, not be there at all whilst they're yeah. really engaged. Yeah. Um, so that can be really, really helpful. Yeah. 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 Um, and then going back to walking, um, one of the problems mm -hmm. that we've mentioned, um, chronic fatigue or you know, weakness um, and the difficulty with endurance. Um, you know, some people mm -hmm. might be able to walk a few paces, but not be able to perform any sort of functional, you know, they're not able to walk to the bus, they're not able to get to work, they're not able to make it to, you know, the school building. So what do we do when people are having difficulty walking that's also related to endurance um, and it's not functional basically um, the walking is not getting them where they need to go yeah so I guess I guess it's twofold there really we we um, use what we call a graded goal setting approach so we would really have a look at um, once kind of sitting down and doing lots of kind of pacing education and then we would set graded goals as to how we might very gradually increase someone's walking endurance. Yeah. Um, and sometimes that's, uh, that might be combined with using aids and adaptations in the short term or yeah. in the long term, depending on the patient. Mm. Um, so, for example, we often um, will get patients that come in to our inpatient program and will be using a wheelchair for all mobility because the walking endurance is reduced. Yeah. And what we might do is uh, set very uh, small goals about walking even around their bed space in the in, in starting point or walking to the bathroom as a starting point and then using their wheelchair for the rest of the time on the ward and then gradually increasing that. Yeah. Um, we wouldn't just go in and take away someone's wheelchair. It's always done in a very graded way yeah. uh, with um, a clear pacing plan in mind. And then as, as the patient's um, capacities improve, then we gradually uh, increase the amount they're walking. And we also look at um, changing the environment that the person is walking in. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. And the other thing to be mindful of, I mean, I have a picture of crutches here. Um, I know when I came down um, with FND, which wasn't diagnosed for a number of years, um, was initially diagnosed as a stroke. And I was sent home on a pair of crutches like we have on the screen. Um, and I was dragging myself around on the pair of crutches and I ended up with severe pain on my shoulders. So it's also mm -hmm. around, you know, not prescribing harm basically, um, because I know that the crutches did a lot of damage to me because I wasn't strong enough to drag myself around. Mm -hmm. mm. And yeah. it's also being very mindful that if someone is prescribed AIDS and adaptations that they're taught how to use them properly. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. So, you know, for example, the, the crutches that you have on the screen, Kate, we quite often um, see that people are transferring out of their chairs by pushing up through their crutches. Yeah. And, you know, having your arms up in a, in a position where you're pushing up with your shoulders up and your hands up is not a normal way of transferring. Yeah. Um, and that, that in itself can cause secondary pain issues. So um, whatever, you know, there is, a, there is a time and a place for AIDS and adaptations, but people, people should, should be aware of how to use them properly 
yeah. and they should be um, the, a plan should be made as to how to move away from using them over time using a rehab approach yeah. Yeah. if and appropriate. Yeah, and I know yeah. today, I was, there was no training on that. It was basically sent home, and I'm like, well, what's the transition? You know, yes. um, so I went down yeah. to one crutch and I was dragging myself along even more, and I ended up with much more severe right sided pain. Um, exactly. And I just became, you know, not strong enough to use them to drag, to dra keep dragging myself. Yes, yeah, yeah. of course. Yeah. Yeah, and the other thing, of course, is we've talked about the boom and bust approach. I think a lot of us push ourselves as hard as we can go um, and then mm. become so weak that we can't do anything. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and unfortunately, uh, pain and fatigue does tend to go hand in hand with F&D and understandably yeah. so when you think about the impact, but, uh, you know, the way that F&D is generated as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. All right. Um, so types of therapy, we've talked really a, a lot about, you know, types of interventions that people might have. Um, are there any types of therapies that an occupational therapist might use for people with FND? So, I mean, as you know, Kate, um, OTs um, have a very wide and varied role. Yeah. Um, but, but it can... Uh, if we're thinking about the kind of things that we might do day to day, we've spoken about um, teaching and implementing normal movement yeah. strategies within function, um, fatigue and pain management, um, anxiety and relaxation strategies, if, if that's relevant for the person. Um, graded task practice makes up a lot of our time with patients with F&D. Yeah. So that's identifying something that the patient um, might find difficult or challenging and um, reintegrating them into that activity using a very graded step approach yeah. um, whilst also implementing taught symptom management strategies for the F&D. Yeah. Um, we, of course, OTs get involved with vocational rehab. So that could be trying to either... Um, help sustain someone in work or sustain someone in their study or voluntary roles yeah. but it can also it can also be helping a person with f and d withdraw positively from work yeah. or um, study as well because sometimes work is a significant maintaining factor of yeah. functional symptoms and um, people are not able to return to the type of job that they had. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So vocational rehab can, um, you know, be quite a varied role again, but it could be liaising with employers or universities or schools on the person's behalf, um, it, uh, speaking about what F&D means and what, um, how that might impact upon their role engagement. Yeah. Um, and but also how um, symptom management strategies can be integrated within the vocational tasks as well yeah. and how, how employers can support that and, and sometimes that's through implementation of reasonable adjustments. Yeah. Sometimes it's about having extra rest breaks or maybe extra time for exams yeah. or extra, times, extra time for assignments um, or just providing, you know, you know, um, support in meetings, for example. Mm. So um, that vocational rehab role can be very varied. Um, yeah. Yeah. We also um, we also might uh, obviously OT is, is about getting people back involved with tasks that they want to do. So that could be uh, domestic tasks, parenting roles. Um, one of the other things that we we do is supported risk taking. So. We, we mentioned briefly in, in the context of functional seizures that understandably so people with functional seizures often disengage from, from tasks that they perceived um, to be risky. Yeah. Uh, but when that happens, people's worlds get smaller and smaller. Yeah. Um, and then every time they try and re-engage in a similar task, it becomes just, it can become very overwhelming and very scary. Yeah. Um, so a, real, a, a key role for occupational therapy is supported risk taking and, and again reintegrating people into normal day-to-day -day tasks in a very graded way 
yeah. um, whilst using taught symptom management strategies for, for their F and D. Yeah. Yeah. And as you know, you mentioned employment and study, that sort of purposeful activity um, is really important for people's life so that the world is not getting smaller and that they're still engaged and they feel they have a purpose and meaning in life. So it's really of important. Course. Yeah. And accommodation, yeah, and it, yeah. accommodation yeah. in the workplace is just so important for people to feel like they can keep working. Yeah. Of course. And of course, there's also huge financial implications if someone yeah. loses their work, job yeah. as well. Yeah. And we all know that, you know, um, you know, financial stresses can be, you know, huge maintaining yeah. factors um, yeah. for functional symptoms because, you know, it's incredibly stressful to have yeah. a loss of income. Yeah, yeah, very much. Mm. Loss of, end, up, end up being, you know, financial stress and loss of identity and loss of purpose and loss of meaning. Um, so, of course. Yeah. So yeah. really important. Yeah. 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 All righty. Um, and you mentioned um, earlier about distraction. Um, and so this relates to, you know, papers are often referring to this, you know, when the person's attention is distracted, the movement disorder symptoms might disappear or dampen. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned that a bit with that tremor entrainment. Um, does that happen with other um, symptoms of FND, you know, like functional motor symptoms? Can we improve um, people's you know, well-being and recovery through the use of distraction? Definitely, and I mean, I guess again, that's the beauty of occupational therapy in that um, we use function as a form of treatment, so yeah. engagement in daily activities, and in, in essence, that engagement in the daily activities can be um, a form of distraction. Yeah, um, and so you're very, as we mentioned. Before, before you very commonly see that a patient's um, symptoms might not be as prominent when they're really engaged in something um, of meaning or something that they're enjoying, yeah. or even if they're engaged in a in a really um, a good conversation with someone. Mm. So intervening at the level of function is a form of distraction in itself. Yeah. Um, but other other distraction techniques that can be really um, helpful. Uh, um, some people find when they're up and moving around that, uh, you know, having some music on in the background is really helpful or when they're engaged in a cooking task, mm. um, they might find um, that if they're really engaged in a conversation that their focus is taken off the symptoms. Mm. Um, if we had someone up, for example, in a standing frame um, when you've kind of, you've got a captured audience, they can't go anywhere. <laughs> Sometimes, uh, sometimes the, uh, put, we put music on in the gym a lot. Mm. Uh, we play uh, mind games. We might play, uh, do something, uh, play a board game whilst they're up and we're increasing the yeah. weight bearing in their lips. Mm. Um, also, sometimes if people focus in on another symptom management strategy, such as diaphragmatic breathing, that can actually take focus off the symptom because they're, re they're really focused in on another strategy. Yeah. Uh, so the idea is to try and take their focus off the symptom at hand and take yeah. their mind somewhere else. Yeah. 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 And that's important. Um, a lot of rehab, um, certainly that I've been to, they're very focused on you know, the symptom or the task or the walking. And I've, have found you know, your symptoms sort of exacerbate. Your walking gets worse when you're focused on it. Yeah. Of course, of course, yeah. because because movement should be happening at an automatic level. Yeah. Um, and uh, and unfortunately, that's what F and D does is it it, it makes auto, you know it kind of breaks down automatic movement. <laughs> yeah. Um, inadvertently uh, and without conscious control, attention gets driven towards the body. Mm. Yeah. yeah. And I've often thought, you know, if we were doing sort of dancing, I used to dance a lot, which I haven't been able to do too much, but I thought if we incorporated dancing into physio, I might be a bit better, you know, because then you're sort of thinking about dance moves rather than focusing on you know, the yeah. symptoms. So I think it's Yeah, really certainly, yeah. Out. My team yeah. does that a lot. Yeah. yeah. We've, had a, we've had a number of... Um, a number of professional dancers with F&D, actually. Yeah. So, um, of course, we do incorporate... Yeah. We incorporate um, dancing into the the treatment yeah. uh, mm. into the treatment. Uh, we use things like yoga and tai chi a lot. Yeah. Because um, yeah. if you're focused in on a symptom, uh, uh, focused in on a actual technique, 
um, attention can yeah. be taken away from the symptom. Yeah, yeah, I agree with that. Like with the Tai Chi, you're focused on that deliberate movement. Um, so that's yes. where your attention is. Um, and it's like with dancing, when you're trying to remember the steps and the different types of movement, that's what you're focused on. Yeah, yeah. 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 And the other thing, the other strategy that can be really helpful, Kate, actually, is um, uh, having a mirror in front because you would think that actually that would draw attention to the body. But what we find is that a person's attention is kind of outside of their body yeah. looking into the mirror. Yeah. And uh, that can be really helpful to access uh, normal movement. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. And I can so remember, we do use yeah. it a lot. Yeah, I've had that mirror in front of me and you're focused on, you know what, you know that the movement looks wrong, so you're focused on trying to get it right and to visualise it in the mirror. Yes, yeah. yeah. And again, you mentioned visualisation. That's a really good yeah. strategy as well. Yeah. 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 Julie, yeah. were you about to say something? Oh, I was just about to say, um, because I had a multidisciplinary treatment with um, a neurologist, Dr. Alex Len in Brisbane. And right. uh, yeah, I was really fortunate. And um, the physiotherapist, the neurophysiotherapist actually was, did Glenn Nielsen's approach. Uh, but I always remember when you say distraction and automatic movement um, and losing the whole ability of automatic movement. I remember one time I was at the bar and we were trying to do side movements and I, I could go one way, but the left side was affected. You know, it was very weak, heavy, etc. And I always remember standing there and absolutely trying so hard to lift my left leg to move it mm -hmm. to the side. Mm -hmm. and, and I remember saying to Dash, my physiotherapist, I said, I just, I can't do it. It's so heavy and, and I didn't know. Do I lift it? Do you know you're totally focused on how did I do it? Just a simple movement. Anyway, Dasha just, without my knowledge, just flicked her finger against my left leg, <laughs> just below the knee, and you know my my automatic response just kicked in. It was the weirdest feeling, <laughs> and then I got so excited because I said to Dasha, I don't want to forget this movement. And I kept, I kept walking to the side numerous times because I didn't want to forget how to do it. Yeah. And it's so, you know, when you're experiencing that, um, yeah, it's it just a simple distraction, you know, mm -hmm. can make all the difference. And it actually kicks in the automatic movement and it's like, oh, my gosh, it's mm -hmm. mo I'm moving and I'm moving correctly. So yeah, yeah. It, it's it's a huge journey, and I think also it's really important to let people know that it's you you are dealing you're sort of moving at a turtle's pace. You know, mm -hmm. the journey of rehabilitation with FND it takes months and months. It's not days, mm -hmm. and it, you know, learning to to uh, move again, the simplest of movement, you know, it, it's and learning how to pace with fatigue and all that mm. and with the chronic pain. So, um, yeah. And repetition, very, repetition and rehearsal is really key, isn't it? So, so um, mastering each step before you move on to the next one and before you increase task complexity is really important. Um, Absolutely. Because as you can probably appreciate, Julie and, and Kate, that one thing that F&D does is really knocks your confidence in your own abilities. And yeah. um, having confidence um, and in a step before you move on and in, increase um, the task complexity is quite important in building that confidence. Yeah. And then confidence in, in your own body and in, in its capacities. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, mm. because, um, you know, we find on on our group with our members that many people were very, you know, were really high achievers. So mm. we expect a lot of our bodies, yeah. you know, <laughs> normally for FND. Yeah. And we can push our bodies <clears throat> and our, to the max and our bodies respond really well. With FND, 
it's the total opposite. You can the, the more you push, the worse they're going to be. Yes. Rest is absolutely key, and pacing, mm. all that. It's so. It's a big learning curve. Yeah. 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 But also, also, Julie, getting a balance between work and rest. So, what we don't want is exactly. to go the opposite way, um, because prolonged rest can then cause deconditioning, which can yeah. then you know, yes. uh, make pain and fatigue even worse. So it's kind of, it's a really fine balance, but yeah. that's why occupational therapy can be really helpful in helping people to find that, that balance between too much and not enough. And it's also that balance can shift as well. So you might be, you know, doing quite well and you can do more. And then, you know, if you start to go backwards, then you've got to pull that balance back. Um, and then, of course, you know, people get yeah. that boom and bust approach as well because they go, well, you know, I used to do, you know, so many hours up and work, you know, maybe work four hours, but now I need to pull that back or I need to increase it. So knowing, you know, that mm. balance in yourself and if you get a virus that can knock you, you know, or you're dealing with, oh, I've got storm damage, um, things like that, yeah. external <laughs> things that can impact, you know, your well-being and as it does oh, for anyone. Yeah. But just having that, yes. being able to understand that balance and how much rest I need and how much work I can do without causing a relapse. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And just, you know, thinking about F&D as something that will need ongoing management. So, you know, even yeah. if you're having a period of symptom remission, you shouldn't get too complacent. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, you should have good occupational balance and good self-care. Yeah. Um, because their things help to build stress resilience and help to build um, resilience to physical and emotional stresses as well. Yeah. And then mm. some people think, okay, well, I've got no symptoms at the moment. I'm recovered and I get back to my normal life. And then all of a sudden they have another severe or worse relapse. Um, yes. So people yeah. can, you know, the symptoms do start to improve and then they sort of take it too far and end up in a worse state. Mm. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Mm. All right. Now, um, I know some OPs, uh, OTs, do um, sensory modulation, sensory integration. There's a sensory profile. Um, is this something that um, might help with people with FND? Yeah. So it can it can be Kate, um, and you will find that OTs that work in different countries will take a slightly different approach to um, sensory modulation treatment. Um, so, as you probably know, it's really common for people with FND to report um, hypersensitivity to touch, to light, to noise, to movement. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and if, you know, realistically, those problems are not just, uh, not just related to FND. They could also be present in people that have chronic fatigue or with chronic migraine as well. Yeah. Um, but as an OT, it's really important to get a sense of how that might impact upon a person because it can impact upon um, the intensity of um, rehab that the patient might be able to tolerate. Mm. Yeah. So you need to um, consider that as part of um, treatment planning and triage. Yeah. Um, so one of the things that uh, we often do within our program, because many of our patients have um, sensory sensitivity, is... Um, looking at reintegrating someone uh, into their environment in a very graded way. So <coughs> if someone has been, uh, just as an example, um, we you know quite often have people that because of fatigue, because of pain, spend a lot of time in their bedrooms in a quiet environment in bed. Mm. Um, but of course, if, if you're spending your time in a very quiet environment with altered lighting and not much noise, when you come out of that environment, it can seem a bit overwhelming. Yeah. Um, so we would do a very graded approach to introducing them to different sensory input in different environments. Um, and that might be just starting with, you know, a few minutes a day outside of, the, outside of their bedroom and having meals at the dining table with the family and then um, increasing the amount of time they're spending in family areas. Mm. Um, if... Um, or, you know, we quite often see that because of sensory sensitivities, people wear, might wear dark sunglasses or yeah. wear headphones. Yeah. Um, and, and what we would do is, again, in a very graded way, 
start to reduce the use of the, those kind of ad adaptive strategies. Um, because what we know is that um, although it seems right at the time, sometimes those adaptive strategies can make that symptom worse. Um, but again, we might do a very graded approach to gradually reducing the use of those. Um, some people do use uh, the, Jane Eyre's, um, the Jane Eyre's theory of sensory integration. And that involves using a sensory profile. So a sensory profile is, again, sitting down with the person and, and working out what are the things that they um, are exacerbating the sensory sensitivities within their home and um, community environments. Um, how long can they sustain being in those kind of environments? So you're looking at triggers and you're looking at um, capacities. And then as part of that, um, this, as part of a sensory modulation treatment program, it would be about um, combining compensatory strategies to inhibit and grade exposure, whilst also doing sensory-based activities to increase tolerances. Yeah. So it's kind of a bit, a bit of both. Yeah. Um, and certainly in the States, and I know in Australia, um, you know, uh, the sensory profile can form part of occupational therapy treatment. Yeah. Um, and uh, well, across the world, really. Yeah. 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 Um, and that's one thing that you mentioned around the lights and the sensitivity. A lot of people do have that with F and D. Is the bright lights, you know, the shopping centres, the noise, um, can be quite triggering to a number of people. Oh, definitely, definitely. And that's why, rather than uh, avoiding those environments, we would support the person in a very graded way to start to tackle those kind of environments. Yeah, 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 yeah. For short periods of time and then increasing the amount of exposure time. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Whilst also using other symptom management strategies. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, and we often hear, you know, people are told, oh, I just have to retrain my brain. Um, and people are like, what is this? What is retraining my brain? What does rewiring my brain mean? And how is, yeah. you know, how can OTs help people with this? Yeah, so, I mean, in simple terms, we know that, you know, kind of F and D is, is related to the fact that the, the nervous system is not processing information in, an, in a normal way, although there's no damage to the brain or the spinal cord. The way that the nervous system is, is working is, is not working efficiently and not quite working in the right way. So as part of that, what tends to happen is that the, the body can pick up bad habits and it starts to move and interact with um, the environment in different ways and abnormal ways of moving start to get laid down in the nervous system as the norm and normal yeah, yeah? and so when you try and uh, then uh, occupational therapy is really good in terms of retraining the brain by into taking focus off those um, abnormal ways of moving, but and trying to use normal movement strategies within function, which is a form of distractor, yeah. um, to start teaching the body to w uh, work in more efficient ways, yeah. to start um, teaching the brain um, and body to interact with an environment in normal ways so that um, we can help to break down these bad habits or break down these compensatory strategies yeah. or inefficient ways of moving. Um, and again, part of that is through repetition and rehearsal and um, mastery of each step before increasing the task complexity. Yeah. So just engagement in the functional activity with the use of normal movement strategies can, in effect, retrain the brain to work in more efficient and normal ways. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and that also aligns with not pushing yourself so that you're always doing bad movements, like I was dragging my leg along um, and sort of pushing myself and then re that was reinforcing, you know, poor movement. So. Exactly. So we, we kind of really reinforce with our patients with F&D that we've got to get the basics right before we move on to the, to yeah. the bigger and the hard yeah um because what we don't want to do is carry bad habits forward all the time yeah um yeah. and so if we notice that you know so people might be moving for a short period of time with good quality but then as they get more tired or their pain increases 
some of the bad habits, the bad habits yeah, start to creep back habits. in. Yeah. 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 We would always get people to stop at that point and we call it kind of resetting. So refocus in on your strategies, take a rest yeah. and then start the activity again with good quality movement. Yeah. Um, so that those, those um, efficient and, and healthy ways of movement get laid down and they become the norm. Yeah. Yeah, true. Yeah. yeah. And then you build on endurance and length of activity from there with good yeah. quality. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. All right. And the other thing is how we use aids uh, with people with FND. Because mm -hmm. some people cannot are not able to walk with good movement um, for yes. you know, in the community, etc. So how do we make this decision around when we use AIDS, when we don't use AIDS, um, you know, prioritising sort of independence as well. So, you know, in terms of allowing people to do activities such as employment or study that's important to them. Um, so at what point do we mm. start to make these decisions? So I think a provision of AIDS and adaptations, uh, in the past it's been quite a contentious issue for pe people with F and D, I think. But yeah. actually I, I would just re really advocate for OTs to take a common sense approach mm. um, and that when you're thinking about providing a person with AIDS and adaptations, it should re there shouldn't be any blanket rules. It should be yeah. considered on an individual basis depending on those that person's needs. Um, we do know, as we mentioned before, that provision of aids and adaptations can cause secondary problems, yeah. um, such yeah. as increased pain and increased, de um, increased in deconditioning and reduced fitness. Yeah. Um, so if someone's uh, presenting acutely, so what I mean by that is if someone hasn't had symptoms for all that long, um, then you, you, I wouldn't say go in and give that person um, you know, prescribe lots of aids and adaptations and um, major adaptations to the home. You would think about um, pr prescribing using a minimalist approach. So what are the things that the person is really um, struggling with on a day-to-day -day basis? Can we put a little bit of equipment in to increase functional independence and take away um, carer burden? Yeah. And then what you do is A, as we mentioned before, you teach that person how to use that aid appropriately and in the right way. And you make a plan as to how that person should grade off using that equipment, using a rehab approach. Yeah. Um, and that could, that could be a plan over a series of weeks or months, or it could be a plan over a series of a, of a few days, depending on how that person is presenting. Um, but um, so it's useful to think about the stage the person is at. Okay. Yeah. Um, it can be it can be a, it's a different a different situation if the person has had symptoms for a long period of time, um, or symptoms are quite chronic. Um, in those kind of cases, um, you know, the right aid and the right adaptation can really improve independence and improve yeah. quality of life. Yeah. Um, so again, you need to really consider the person's stage in terms of their symptom presentation, but also their lifestyle. So if someone has had, you know, has been off their feet, um, you know, for, for a long time and, uh, but they're housebound because they can't access the community or they're too tired to self propel to work. Yeah. Then in those cases, maybe for example, provision of a power chair, would mean the difference between being housebound and being able to independently access their own community yeah. and get re-engaged in meaningful activities. Yeah. Um, sorry. Yeah. yeah. No, and that's what you know, you're saying. I mean, how long you've had it, what is your, what's your potential for improvement? Have you been trying to improve for a number of years and you're not? We see a number yeah. of people, mainly adults, that seem to be getting progressively worse. Um, we tend to see children have a lot better outcomes than adults um, and we have another number of adults that really over a number of years tend to be getting progressively worse. Mm. So, yeah. Mm. 
Yeah, and I, I yeah. think a lot of that has to do with we don't have a lot of FND trained clinicians. So I, I personally think that um, it's not so much on the person, it's if they're diagnosed in a timely fashion, you know they could be going for years and not have a proper diagnosis. Um, yeah. Number two, a lot of people don't have access to multidisciplinary treatment with FND professionals. Mm. So you have an ideal situation where you diagnose very quickly, you have a multi multidisciplinary team working with you, um, and that sort of, you know, you have a better outcome, I think. Whereas some people, I mean, there's no one size fits all, of course, with FND. But I think a lot of um, people that, you know, they don't seem to... Um, when Kate said we have a lot of people that are progressive with their FND, and but then again we have a lot of people that just can't access clinicians. Yeah, and yeah. you know, being yeah. a very large, big country with only a handful of people in the country who are actually trained in FND, um, increases mm -hmm. the challenges. You know, we've had people of moving course. across the country in order to access services, and some families can't do that. Mm, yeah. Mm, yeah definitely yeah it can be and it's it's the same here in the uk as well it, it's it we have this term called postcode lottery so it, it, it kind of depends on where you live yeah as to what services you can access yeah and that's um, exactly what it is really i mean with yeah, our pediatric yeah. program it's in sydney um there isn't another mm. pediatric program in the country Mm. We've had a good F and D program in Brisbane. There hasn't been a good adult program, you know, across the country. No. So, no. Yeah. Exactly. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, does that answer the question about aids and adaptations, or were there yeah. further questions regarding that? No. Yeah. I think that it's also, you know, around. I mean, I know for myself, I had a point where I was housebound for nine months because I just couldn't even walk to the letterbox, and I didn't have enough equipment to help me and getting mm. an electric wheelchair which meant I wasn't strong enough to propel myself but once I had that mm. electric wheelchair I could get a job I could travel and re-engage in society so my movement's not great but for me yeah. being able to do really important things to travel to run forums meet people work has been really important so there has been that balance around you know using my body as much as I can but but also being able to engage in the activities that I want to engage in. Um, and yeah. so it did change my life because I was able to leave my house. Like I, was on a, I live on a very steep hill and I just couldn't even leave my property. I'd like fall into this cactus plant. So, you know, yeah. I couldn't even... <laughs> okay. yeah. I, I would say also, Kate, um, for those um, people with F&D um, that are worried that once they, once they start using a power wheel, Wheelchair that they'll never get out of it, and th that's not necessarily the case either. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, and we we have patients that come into our program that are using power chairs, and they leave not needing the power chair anymore. So, uh, but again, it's about having access and timely access to the right type of treatment, yeah. um, and the treatment that's right for the patient, because you know one model might not fit everybody. Yeah. Um, the, the nature of F and D is that it can change and it can change over time. And yeah. even when people have had symptoms for quite a while, it, it doesn't mean they won't ever get better again. Yeah. Um, so, you know, but, you know, I think that that's what I'm saying is it needs to be done on an individual basis and yeah. blanket rules don't really work. No, no, no. no. Yeah. yeah. And that's why OTs are just going to be so important across the person's um, journey with FND because, you know, things change over time. People get better, they get worse, they relapse, that sort of stuff. So having an OT there to help that person make those decisions over time can be really important. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. And okay. we're really good at seeing the whole picture. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, and, you know, there are a number of people who, despite their best efforts um, at treatment, um, they might have accessed you know, the best treatment program available, put, you know, a year into trying to recover and just not getting there. Some people just are not, don't recover. 
So mm. how do we help, you know, these people, this group of people? So, again, I mean, if, if people have had adequate access to specialist rehab or it's available, um, but they haven't been able to make gains, then maybe, you know, a focus on, for occupational therapists, a focus on disability management and maximising quality of life might be the yeah. way forward for a particular group of patients. So at times that can be looking at aids and adaptations and home modifications. Um, you know, the right home modifications and the right equipment might mean that a person um, can reduce their care needs and be more independent within their home and their community. Yeah. Um, but as we've mentioned, uh, given the nature of F and D, um, things might change in the future and. Yeah. Timing for rehab is really important. Mm. So, you know, someone, uh, when they are offered rehab, it might not be the right time for them. You know, there might be other things that are going on in their lives that are pre preventing, um, you know, either full engagement or preventing recovery at that period of time. So I would say to patients with FND, don't feel afraid to ask for rehab again in the future if you feel that, you think it would be beneficial or you might be more ready to take up that option at a later yeah. date. Yeah. Um, because things can change over time and people can still get better later on. Yeah. Um, and of course, then uh, it, we mentioned it before you, you asked about how you treat people who have variable and episodic symptoms. Yeah. Um, that's really common with F and D. And that, in fact, it's probably more the norm to have episodic yeah. symptoms than, than yeah. not. Mm. Um, so I would say to people, if you have had a period of remission, don't get too complacent. Yeah. You really need to think about keeping up your occupational balance. So having good self care, eating well, drinking well, having good sleep patterns, not, not burning the candle, not overdoing things. Um, um, or if, if you're having a, pe a period where your symptoms are, uh, you know, not going so well, try not to decompensate and just take to your bed, for example. Yeah. Um, occupational therapists can really help um, people develop a management plan um, for how to manage on good and bad days, yeah. um, completing a relapse prevention plan or relapse management plan, which have, has a look at uh, what do you know about your symptoms so what are the triggers to your symptoms? Um, how you might manage those triggers? Uh, what to do on a good day versus a bad day? Um, having active reflection on if things are not going so well, have a think about why they're not going so well and then make a change. Yeah. 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 Uh, we would all do that if something wasn't going well in our lives, so we should do. Um, so it's no different for F and D yeah. really. Um, yeah. There's generally things underlying triggers. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And it may be that people have pushed mm -hmm. themselves and they've gone back to work and tried to get back to their normal life too quickly and um, just flares up again. So. Yeah, and people will be more, with F&D, people will be more prone um, to having exacerbations of their symptoms when they're under physical and emotional stress. Yeah. yeah. Um, so we all, all of us, regardless of F&D, need, things in our life that help to improve resilience to physical and emotional stresses. Yeah. Um, yes. So it's really important to include that in all of our lives so that we can stay on top of things. Yeah. 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 And not to let routine, structure and routine slip. Yeah. Yeah. Because <laughs> that's really important. Mm. Yeah. 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 Um, and so in Australia, we've got the NDIS and people, you know, some people are looking for, um, you know, insurance, um, disability payments, disability pensions, because they're just not doing well. Um, and people are often asked, you know, for NDIS reports, um, is this condition permanent? Um, so what is the role of the OT in helping people with these applications, you know, getting a disability pension or getting on, you know, assistive technology, that sort of stuff. So how can an OT help people in this yeah, so, I mean, 
it's fair to say that people with F and D are entitled to disability benefits and pensions. Yeah. You know, um, yeah. they shouldn't um, be blocked from access to those. Yeah. Um, OTs can help uh, in a, a few ways in terms of benefits, but the systems involved with applying for benefits um, and pensions can be very difficult to navigate. Um, so OTs can really help with uh, people with their applications. They can help with um, explaining what F and D is and explaining the functional impact on a person. Yeah. Um, and uh, thinking about how um, how that might uh, impact on their day-to-day -day functioning and their ability to, to earn money, for example, or yeah. ability to do things on their own or whether they might have care needs. Yeah. Um, the other thing that can happen in um, is that occupational therapists can help with funding requests for specialist rehab as well. Um, so outlining what the patient's uh, functional impairments might be, how the symptoms are impacting, and how the occupational therapist thinks that specialist rehab might improve a person's function and might be of benefit. Yeah. Um, so that can be really helpful to put down in a letter um, with the support yeah. of your occupational therapist. Yeah. Um, OTs can also make uh, uh, provide advice in ter terms of person's care needs and um, the extent of care required. Um, and again, um, advocate uh, for a person's care on their behalf if, if that is needed. Um, where possible, we would definitely recommend uh, care that is provided using a facilitatory approach. So what I mean by that is that care that works alongside a person to complete a task mm -hmm. rather than doing a task for them. Okay. Um, and certainly we as occupational therapists can have a role in training carers uh, or training, whether that be informal carers, so significant others or whether it be paid care. Mm -hmm. um, so OTs can go in and work with the carers to look at that facilitatory approach and kind of use the carers as co-therapists. Yeah. In, in helping to improve a person's independence and help them get back on track if that is possible. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then, of course, we have things like rehousing um, that OTs uh, might, well, certainly in the UK, I don't know about in Australia, Kate, but as an OT, I quite often get asked to support bids for rehousing. Mm -hmm. um, and we do have a role in that, um, in that sometimes a person's home is a maintaining factor to symptoms yeah so um certainly in the uk many of the uh, many, many of the homes here are double story and, and people are often restricted to their upstairs level of the house and can't get out of the house so yeah. obviously that causes um a lot of secondary problems such as you know people become very socially isolated and people get very low in mood and then that can exacerbate functional symptoms. So yeah. um, we can support bids for rehousing if, if it is necessary or, or if overcrowding is a significant issue um, causing lots of stress, then we, or maybe there's um, neighborly disputes, which mean that people won't go out of their house. Yeah. <laughs> So, you know, you ha again, it's a bit similar to the AIDS and adaptations. You need to yeah. take it on a case by basis. Yeah, very individual. Yeah. Yeah. We wouldn't, we wouldn't normally recommend rehousing in the acute stages, obviously, yeah. because yeah. Uh, yeah. things, can things might change yeah. <laughs> and they might change quite quickly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Again, a common sense approach goes a long way. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, thanks so much for your time and sharing all your knowledge about, you know, how occupational therapists can help people with FND. Um, was there anything that we haven't covered, do you think, that we need to let people know before we finish up? Um, no, I just think, uh, I mean, if you have access to other healthcare professionals within your team, it can of often be really helpful to work alongside them rather than in isolation. Yeah. Um, and the other thing to think about is that if your team has different waiting lists for different professionals, 
um, sometimes it can be helpful to join up and try and um, maybe change that and maybe with patients with FND well, for really any patient with long-term health conditions, having a joint up approach to rehab with yeah. various professionals is often more beneficial because you can, you can get a peer support from your colleagues, but you can also share treatment plans yeah. and um, it can be more goal directed and, and be more uh, rather than being quite providing disjointed rehab. So yeah. that's just something to think about for occupational therapists that are working with other professionals. Yeah, which then supports that multidisciplinary team approach that we were talking about. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Well, thank you, you so advice. much. Yeah, yeah, wonderful. Cool. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. That's okay. Thanks, Julie. Thanks, Kate. Thank you. Thanks.